so this is probably this is probably the best epi single episode of Twin Peaks. Um, I'm not a, as, if you can't tell, I don't include the pilot as part of the season. The reason why is I, why is I'm kind of old school on this. Um, the original way you you purchased anything Twin Peaks was on VHS. They came out with a box set that had season one and season two, but the pilot was sold separately. A lot of the titles of these episodes were done later by who knows who. Uh, they were never originally entitled, so I don't bother with the titles. Um, in fact, I look at the titles, I'm like, they don't even almost make sense. They, they're creative, but they're not, you know, it's my tribe, you know, but they're just not necessary. Uh, so that's why my, my numbering might be a little bit different than what you would see on IMDb or something like that. But this episode is really good. It's directed by David Lynch. Unforgettable beginning. The Horns are having dinner. And this is a great introduction to Benjamin Horn. He comes in and <laughs> he brings food in the middle of their dinner. And um, um, you come to find out they ha him and they have a rapport. And like every character from the pilot on to here, there's just a huge backstory to every single character. Making every one of them both a suspect and not a suspect at the same time. Because you look at him and you go, why would this character, why would you develop this much backstory only to have them turn out to be a murderer? But also is making the audience think about judging from this person's past, could they be the murderer? Very well thought out. This has the single best example of David Lynch's talent in terms of masking exposition you don't even know you're watching exposition. So I believe, uh, I could be mistaken, but I think there was almost a year between the pilot and, and season one. I, I, again, I could be mistaken, but I think that's right. There's at least a season. And so that's that could be at least six to eight months. So by the time you get to this episode, there you have to, you have to remember, you hear older people say this, right? Say this kind of stuff all the time. They did it when I was a kid, and now here I am doing it, okay? But we didn't have <laughs> internet, right? We didn't have email. We didn't have... Um, you, you barely even knew anyone had a car phone. I mean, much less a cell phone, right? The, just These things existed. They just weren't... They weren't common, and they were so uncommon that characters and shows didn't have them. Um, so that said, you couldn't go on the internet and look up these characters. It just wasn't possible. You couldn't say, hey, you know, who's Shelly Johnson again? Now let's, look, let's look up all the characters, which would have happened. So you relied on Friends with Good Memories, which I did. I'm sure everyone did. Has, who's this character? And they would know and, and you know. That's the one they remind you, like, oh yeah, okay. So it made sense that they had a scene where you get reintroduced to every single character. Now, if you know anything about Twin Peaks, this is a kind of a good trivia question. What scene, scene am I talking about? I'll take a sip of coffee, give you a chance to think about that for a minute. Don't know? Okay. Well, um, it's the scene where... Um, Cooper claims that he went to sleep, had a dream about Tibet. Um, he explains what Tibet is and the Dalai Lama being deposed and so forth. And he says he woke up with a new deductive technique. Now let's pause right there. Now I've used the terms first world, second world, third world, just to keep things simple. I, I didn't get that from anyone or anything. That's just to categorize things in my own mind. But is that not telling you that Cooper's attachment to the third world is having a major impact on the first world? And I love how Harry Truman is the audience, right? This is that normalcy that David Lynch keeps in his films and stories and television shows so that it's grounded enough that when something strange happens, it's really strange, and it's strange to the characters in his shows. All of David Lynch's friends say he's a normal guy. I believe them, because 
Although I don't think he's that normal. But I, I believe that he's normal in general, though, because he understands that these things are strange. And so Harry's like, you really got this technique in a dream? And he's like, yes. Yes, I did. Agent Cooper says that. And so in light of season three, what we're learning then is that Agent Cooper's a dream ability to dream is also affecting the first world and maybe even the third world possibly it's hard to hard to know isn't it you know when you look at season three so he really is um the p potentially the dreamer when you remember i said i really think season one had the biggest uh it, you know transfer of information into season three than anything else in the series and i could be wrong about that but it seems to be that agent cooper could be really have an effect on everything just with his dreams Kind of interesting. Uh, I'm not really sure about that. Just something I've been contemplating. But uh, so because his dreams override and seem to connect everything together, right? Because it, I don't know if I said this previous episode, so I want to get to it real fast. In this episode, we learn, this is where you learn and see for the first time what turns out to be the Black Lodge. It's just his dream at this point, but it turns out to be the Black Lodge. And that's, of course, the third world. And so he gets information and he meets, we find out uh, later, that he meets Laura Palmer and she meets him in her dream. And since season three, and I, we'll get on that later when, I, when I, no, I think that's season two. Oh, well, anyway, so we see that being the dreamer may be the most powerful thing that can happen here, okay? Anyway, so to finish up what this scene actually is. So this is a scene where, he has Deputy Hawk stand there with the oven mitts holding the rocks. He has a bottle set up in the distance, and he names a character. We see a picture of the character, and he throws the, the rock at the bottle. Brilliant mask of exposition. Um, all people do when they watch this is go, this is so weird. But it's not that weird. You, it's very. It's actually quite pragmatic. It is... You need to be reminded who these characters are. Now, here's what you... So, this is so fascinating. This scene, because it was masked so well from being exposition to being story, it, it's, it, it's timeless. I wasn't bored watching this scene. I wasn't going, oh, we got to be reintroduced to these characters. Okay, I'll sit here and tolerate it. No. I was glued. I've seen it 7,000 times and I was fascinated. Timeless storytelling. Absolutely timeless storytelling. Um, so you're just seeing these characters pop up on the screen and you're going, oh, yeah, I know who that is. But today it plays off like it did back then, which is what a strange scene. And what we're learning so much about Agent Cooper and about every character, actually. This is one of the big scenes where you learn about their obsession with coffee and donuts. They're all set, it's all set up out there and everything. And all it was was just kind of a silly cop joke. Back then, uh, cops and donuts was a thing. People would always say that about cops. And that's all it really is, and is that taken to the extreme. Uh, but it comes off as quirky and weird in Twin Peaks. So this is, again, one of the reasons whenever you have people critique David Lynch... I, I don't disagree with him very often. Like, I get some of these critiques, but sometimes they miss things about this guy, okay? He's got some really good ideas. He's He knows what he's doing, and he's this is a really good example of that. Finally, this will be a shorter um, installment here, but we learned about One-Eyed Jacks. Again, very important that the second world... Um, the, the investigation is primarily, and the show at this point, is primarily focused on taking what you experience in the first world and digging into the second world. Whereas season three spent more time on the third world. And I'll tell you something, that's one of the problems with season three. Because the third world's more interesting, the more mysterious it is. The more I don't know about it, the more mysterious it is. And so... One of the issues with third, the third season is you'll hear people say, well, 
they didn't spend enough time in Twin, Twin Peaks. I think that's absolutely true. I completely agree, but it's worse than that. It's not just they didn't spend enough time in Twin Peaks. It's they spent too much time on things that should have remained a mystery. And I appreciate what Lynch and Frost were doing. A lot of people focused on the narrative of, uh, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing these people who said this. They're right. I mean, they said that uh, Lynch and Frost were really making, doing social commentary on nostalgia. Yeah, I think that's potentially true. Um, maybe even absolutely true. But I, I don't think that was the primary focus. I think the primary focus was to explain some things. <laughs> Why was Bob after Laura? I, and I appreciate their efforts to do that. I just think it was unnecessary. I think it was would have been better just to expand on the, like, okay, for example, and I know this isn't about season three, but it, I, I'm using these this chance as an opportunity to show you some things that I think are worth our, your time thinking about if you ever watch season three. You get some scenes where they find some of the lost diary of Laura Palmer in season three. It's It's the best stuff. It's the best stuff. It, that's what season three should have been about. And if, if they had focused less on the Black Lodge stuff and a little more of just trying to understand it all and figure it out and remain in the mystery, I think David Lynch would have gotten what, you know, with what he wanted with Laura Palmer's murder, which is he never wanted it solved because it generated so much mystery. Well, same thing with the Black Lodge. I guess if I was David Lynch and I heard me saying this, my only response would be, well, the Black Lodge is so mysterious that I can explore it all I want and there'll still be mystery. It'd be hard to argue with that. But then you spend less time in Twin Peaks, which is what people really wanted to see. Of course, another thing you have to like about a narrator like David Lynch is he probably doesn't really care that much about what his audience wants to see. Um, Quentin Tarantino famously <laughs> critiqued... Uh, um, fire walk with me by saying it was self-indulgent we'll just put it that way he thought it was self-indulgent but i love that about fire walk with me i loved it that somebody was so obsessed with this world that they put it on screen and didn't care what anyone would think of it that's what i love about that movie it's so so bizarre and it's just bizarre from a personal standpoint that he was like Hmm, so fixated with this character and this time in her life that he didn't have any concept of how this would impact everything. It was, and again, it aged great. And this season three was his effort to rectify some of that. And he was successful in my opinion. Uh, and I appreciate it. I appreciate what he was trying to do for the audience there. But at the end of the day, he'll never top what he did in this episode. This was... It's not my favorite episode of Twin Peaks. My favorite episode of Twin Peaks is coming up. It's the second to last, I think. Um, it's where the investigation's really heating up. And it's real good. I, I'll, I can't wait to talk about it. But anyway, this went on a little bit longer than I thought. Um, I think this is the best episode, though. Not for me personally, but in terms of just what is Twin Peaks, let them watch this. It doesn't get any better than this. All right. Have a good one.